Good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's class. It's actually a continuation from yesterday's session. And today we'll be starting with stroke. Stroke is a damage to the brain when there's an interruption from blood supply to the brain. Uh, yesterday we said when we had a obstruction to the coronary artery, we said it was myocardial infarction. Yeah, if we have obstruction or any blockage to the cerebral vessels, that's what we refer to as a stroke. It's an abrupt onset of neurological deficits resulting from interference with blood supply to the brain. Again, just like we saw with our myocardial infarction, it could be caused by a thrombosis or embolism or a hemorrhage. Again, the NCLEX wants to know, are you able to identify a patient that's having a stroke? We all know the FAST test, the FAST, F-A-S-T, where F would be, you're looking at the patient's face and you're looking out for facial drooping. So again, look at the face for facial drooping. That's our F. A would be any arm drift. So you ask them to stretch out their arms and you're looking out for drifting in either of the hands or both of the hands. So that would be A, arm drift. S would be any slurring of their speech. So you want them to say something and you want to look out for any slurring in their speech. And T, T means time. So if any of those indicators are present in your patient, T means time, the time to act is now. So you want to know that fast test when you're assessing your patient. Uh, what else would you see generally? We are going to see changes in vital signs and neurological signs. One key feature you would always see on the NCLEX uh, with patients with stroke would be hemianopsia, hemi half. Nopsia referring to visual eyes. So there's going to be loss. Remember, we said A is a prefix for absence. So there's so loss of vision or loss of half of the visual field. So again, that's what you would, would mean by hemianopsia. So that's what you're going to see in a patient with stroke. Um, and that's what it would look like. So again, you can see the tray of a patient who has stroke. And then you can see they kind of eat. Uh, they've only eaten one side of the plate. So they've lost the visual field to the left. So that's what we refer to as hemianopsia. Or it could also be homonymous hemianopsia. So you have a vision loss on the same side of the visual field in both eyes. That would be homonymous hemianopsia. What else are you going to see in this client? There will be decreased sensation or what we refer to as neglect syndrome. So patients who have neglect syndrome, they actually act as if portions of their world do not exist. So you want to think of it as maybe a lack of awareness of that particular side. So this common stroke effect can reduce your patient's ability, that, that independence, that able, being able to live independently. And again, they are a very high risk for injury. So for example, if your patient with neglect syndrome is looking at a clock, this is what he's going to be seeing. Again, you can see they are totally kind of lost awareness of the other side. And because of that, there could be uh, threats on this side, which you would not see. Again, remember we said the NCLEX is more of a safety exam. So you want to be conscious whenever we talk about safety issues on any of the topics. So again, with neglect syndrome, uh, they're going to act as if portions of their world do not exist. They have that lack of awareness on that particular side, and it puts them at a high risk for injury. What else are we going to see in our clients? What symptoms are they going to complain of? Okay, so again, they could complain of headaches. We could see mental changes. Again, you're looking out for those changes in levels of consciousness, confusion, disorientation any memory impairment. So that's what you're going to see in a patient with a stroke. We could also see aphasia. Again, aphasia has to do with speech. A is that prefix for absence. So there will be kind of 
uh, disorder with their speech. So aphasia would be a language disorder that affects the patient's ability to communicate. We're also going to see respiratory problems in this client due to those reduced or decreased neuromuscular controls. There will be decreased cough reflex, decreased swallow reflex, decreased, uh, they would also have dysphagia. So again, with all of this, uh, with all of this, the patient can present with difficulty swallowing. So they can present with difficulty swallowing. So you want to take note of that, uh, that there's a risk for uh, aspiration in these clients. Okay, what else can we see in this client? We could also see agnosia. So what's agnosia again? That decreased sensory interpretation. They could suffer from bladder or bowel incontinence. These clients are at a high risk for seizures. So they could suffer seizures. Oh, let's see what we have on this other side. Okay, you could see that one-sided paralysis, hemiplegia. You can see that also in these clients with stroke. They could suffer from emotional liability. What's emotional liability again? Please, you need to understand what each of these symptoms are so that when the NCLEX presents it to you, because now they might not tell you this patient has a stroke, or rather they're going to tell you, uh, this patient has this rapid, for example, he starts crying uncontrollably, or all of a sudden he starts laughing un uncontrollably, or he has this heightened irritability or temper. That's emotional liability. It refers to that rapid, exaggerated changes in mood where strong emotions or feelings occur. So these clients with a stroke, they could also present with emotional liability. We could also see visual changes, which we already talked about. We said homonymous hemanopsia is one of them, which we said it will have that loss of the visual field in one side. Again, we could have Horner's syndrome, tosis of the upper eyelid. So you see the upper eyelid drooling. So that's what we refer to as honor syndrome. There are other symptoms you could see in clients with upper, uh, with honor syndrome. So there could be constrictions of the pupils. There could be that tosis we talked about of the upper eyelid. You can also have anhydrosis. So there will be absence of sweating of the face. So you will notice that these clients do not sweat on their face. So all of that would add up to Horner's syndrome. We could also see perceptual defects. And again, we could see hypertension in these clients and apraxia. These are common symptoms we'll see. So let's look at what we need to do to manage these clients. So our immediate care for this patient, what we need to know for the NCLEX. Remember we said this client is at risk for dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, drooling, and all of that. So we must maintain a patent airway and we need to minimize activity in this client. So you must maintain a patent airway, that's priority. Again, we want to keep the head of the bed elevated 15 to 30 degrees. Again, this is going to help to prevent increased intracranial pressure because of the risk for seizures. Remember, we talked about seizure precautions yesterday. So one of them would be having to keep the side rails in an upright position. You want to pad those side rails. And we want to administer thrombolytics within three hours of onset of symptoms. Again, you must understand that. that key features you need to look out for on the NCLEX. Most times, the difference could just be knowing what the time frames are. Because if you tell me a patient has a stroke and they tell me which of these select order that apply, which should be a correct answer. Yes, we know we want to give thrombolytics. But again, do we know that it must be within three hours of consent of symptoms? Because they can tilt the timelines and that will make a correct answer incorrect because we know yes thrombolytic is a good one but three hours the time frame was going to make that answer wrong remember we talked about knowing your topic and that's one thing you must use when you are trying to identify the topic those time frames why are they telling me post-operative why are they telling me two hours after surgery why are they telling me uh, two days before you need to 
take note of those time frames because that could determine whether your answer is correct or not. As part of our intermediate, uh, intermediate care and rehabilitative needs, we need to position for good body alignment and comfort. We must institute measures that facilitate swallowing. Remember we said this client is at risk for aspiration. So we must institute measures that facilitate swallowing, like having the client sit in an upright position with the head flexed slightly, instructing the client to use their tongue actively when they are eating. We can administer liquids slowly. You don't want to rush them when you are giving them liquids. Um, if, if you are feeding the clients because of those muscle weakness, you want to place the food on the unaffected side of the mouth. You want to provide semi-solid foods. You want to instruct the client to swallow while they are eating. So they need to swallow while they are eating. And again, after eating, you want them to maintain an upright, an upright position um, at least 30 to 45 minutes after eating. Okay, thank you very much to Lulokbe. She says a thrombolytic is given in ischemic stroke and not hemorrhagic stroke. Okay, very good. That's a very good observation. So again, with stroke, we always want to carry out a CT as soon as possible. What are we trying to rule out? We want to rule out if it's a hemorrhagic stroke or a, uh, an ischemic stroke. And if you have an ischemic stroke, or if we have a, a hemorrhagic stroke where there's a risk of bleeding, we don't want to give thrombolytics. Rather, we'll need this patient to be managed uh, by a specialist. Okay, thank you very much. So again, we want to provide skin care. We want to perform passive and active range of motion exercises. We want to orient the client to person, time and place. We want to move the affected extremities slowly and gently. And we also want to teach the client use of supportive devices like the commode or our trapeze, or even if they're using a cane to ambulate. We also need to ad address communication needs. Remember we said they could have issues communicating. So again, when you are talking with your patient, you want to face the client and you want to speak clearly and slowly. You also want to give this patient time to respond. You don't want to rush them. And if you want to approach this patient, remember we talked about the hemonymous hemanopsia, where there's a loss of visual field in one side. So when you want to approach the patient, don't approach him from that visually impaired side. And you always want to encourage use of the affected side. So those are things we can uh, do for this patient with a stroke. Let's look at abdominal injury, which is any injury to the abdomen. Again, abdominal injuries can present as either a penetrating injury where there'll be symptoms of bleeding. Uh, maybe there'll be issues with the small bowels or the large bowels that could be affected. It is a penetrating injury. Again, it could also be a blunt injury, maybe by impact with a dull object. So you could have a penetrating injury, penetrating abdominal injury, or a blunt uh, abdominal injury. So what are we going to see in this client with an abdominal injury? There's going to be abdominal pain and rigidity, that abdominal rigidity, you know, the stomach, there's going to be stiffness of the stomach muscles, especially when you touch the patient or if someone touches the patient's abdomen, they're going to have, have that stiffness of the stomach muscle or what we refer to as abdominal rigidity. You could also see abdominal distension. The client could complain of nausea and vomiting. They could be in shock. Again, what are those symptoms we talked about when your patient is in shock? We said the BP down, pulse and respiration up. You always want to remember that on the NCLEX. BP down, pulse and respiration up. Again, we could see ecchymosis. So there could be bleeding under the skin due to the trauma especially with blunt injuries, we could see ecchymosis. And this is indicative of retro peritoneal bleeding. So there's gonna be bleeding underneath the skin. Again, for the NCLEX, you must know these signs. If the bleeding, if, if the bleeding is around the umbilicus, what do we call it? We call it Collins sign. 
So you can, if, it's, if it's bleeding, if it's around the umbilicus, it's called Collins sign. But if it's around or if it occurs in either of the flanks on the side, it's called Turner sign. Remember, we talked about pancreatitis the last time, and we said you could see gray Turner's uh, syndrome. That's what we refer to as Turner sign or gray Turner sign. Again, if the bleeding is around the umbilicus, it tells you, we call it Collins sign. And if it's in either flanks, it is called uh, Turner's sign. Again, these clients could also have what we call balance sign. So again, they could have what we call balance sign. If you try to percuss the left flank, you're going, to, you're going to hear this dull sound. That's what we refer to as balance sign. So there will be dullness on, on percussion of the left upper quadrant. And what does it tell you? It indicates that there could have been rupture of the spleen. So again, you want to take note of these three signs. Calling signs, if it's around the umbilicus. Turner sign, if it's on the flank and it's indicative of uh, pancreatitis or balance sign, if the abdominal injury had uh, affected the or ruptured the spleen, the client could have balance sign. So you, when you percuss, you are going to have this resonance over the spleen. So there will be that dullness. Okay, so what's our plan for either of these kind of wounds, our penetrating wounds? What do we want to do? We want to manage the client by placing him on neoperoral. We might need to insert an NG tube, monitor the drainage. We want to listen to bowel sounds. Are they getting decreased? Uh, we want to insert an indwelling catheter and monitor the output carefully. We also want to assess for hematuria. So that will be blood in the urine. And for blunt injury, most times you might not see the bleeding. What do we want to do? We want to use an IV with large bone needles in the upper extremity. So one inserts an IV with large bone needle in the upper extremities, preferably 14 to 16 gauge. So you want to remember that large IV bone needles, 14 to 16 gauge. Remember with these clients, uh, high volume fluid resuscitation may be required. And this is gonna help us, this 14 to 16 gauge, it will help us once we've inserted it in the upper extremities. Again, you just want to get your IV line in anticipation of any further potential problems when fluid resuscitation or even medication might be necessary. We would also want to monitor the client's CVP. Again, we'll talk about CVP in another session. But again, remember that CVP, central venous pressure, we actually use it to assess the fluid status of our patients. We use it to assess the fluid status of our patient. And your normal CVP should be between two to six millimeters of mercury. Again, we, need, we use our CVP to assess the fluid status in our patient. So any condition that alters maybe the venous return or the blood volume or maybe the contractility of the heart or cardiac performance would actually affect the client CVP. And if we say the normal level should be between two to six millimeters of mercury, if it's elevated, what does it tell you? Our client is retaining fluid. There's fluid retention in that patient. So look out for that on the NCLEX. It's a CVP elevated. It tells me either my client is retaining fluid or there's a problem with the contractility of the heart. The heart muscles are not contracting the way they should. Probably there's a myocardial contractile dysfunction. So again, elevated CVP, I'm thinking about fluid retention. Elevated CVP, I'm thinking about myocardial contractility dysfunction. Either of those could cause my CVP to be elevated. How about if the CVP is low, if it's less than two? then it's obviously, uh, I'm obviously looking at maybe my client is dehydrated or there's volume depletion or there's a decreased venous tone in this patient. Again, we'll talk about CVP subsequently, but you want to take those key highlights down. We also need to check the client's 
blood values, arterial blood gases. We'll also talk about this subsequently. Uh, serum electrolytes, liver and kidney functions. We want to uh, assess all of that. We want to place the client on a cardiac monitor and might also need to put in an indwelling catheter. With chest trauma, this would be any form of injury to the chest, maybe affecting the ribs or the heart or the lungs. And obviously, when your patient has a trauma to the chest, they will have extreme pain. They will be complaining of extreme pain. If you touch the area, it will be tender. They might have difficulty breathing. Remember, we said if it affects the ribs, the ribs help with breathing. If it affects the lungs, it would help it to affect their breathing. So there will be significant difficulty in breathing in this kind of patients with uh, chest trauma. Let's look at one form of chest trauma, which would be flail chest. What's flail chest again? So here you see a fracture of multiple adjacent ribs and that fracture is going to cause the chest wall to become unstable and they start responding paradoxically. That's a big word there. What does that mean? There will be, the, the, the chest wall will be moving in opposite to what would normally be expected that they should move. So that's what we mean by paradoxical movement. So again, you are seeing uh, multiple fractures of adjacent ribs. So you can see there's a fracture of adjacent ribs, and then it's going to cause the chest wall to become unstable. And they're going to start responding paradoxically, moving in opposite to what we would normally see in this patient. So a segment of the rib cage breaks and becomes separated or detached from the chest wall. And this could be a life-threatening uh, condition. Again, that's that paradoxical movement. Normally, with inspiration, the chest is supposed to be moving out for you to draw in breath. But what happens in the flail segment? You see the chest wall moving in the opposite direction. How about with expiration? The chest should be moving inwards. But again, if you look at the flail area, the chest is moving outwards. That's what we mean by paradoxical movement. Again, you want to look out for this on the NCLEX because the NCLEX may not tell you the patient has a flail chest, or rather they will tell you, you're looking at the patient's chest and there's this uneven movement in one segment of the chest. You want to start suspecting flail chest in your patient. How do we manage this patient? Again, there's a possibility for shock, so we need to monitor for that. What are those symptoms we are looking out for, for shock? I would always put this in your face because I want this to stick. You want to know that once my client's BP is going down and the pulse and respirations are going up, my patient might be in shock. In increased intracranial pressure would be the opposite of shock. With ICP increase, you're going to see the BP going up and we're also going to see the pulse going down and also the respiration going down. Okay, so we want to monitor for shock. Again, with shock, we said there's going to be increased res respiration or tachypnea. So we are also monitoring, looking out for that shallow, rapid breathing or tachypnea that you will normally see with shock. Uh, we also need to monitor the client's arterial blood gas levels. We'll talk about this subsequently when my patient is in metabolic acidosis or respiratory acidosis and how we need to uh, evaluate these values to know what's happening with our patient. With this patient, we'll need to give him humidified oxygen. Again, you're running the oxygen through, uh, through water to help to humidify it. And that's going to elevate any soreness or dryness in the throat or the nose. So that's why we want to give him humidified oxygen. What else can we do for this patient? We can encourage turning, deep breathing, and coughing, and as a last resort, we might need to carry out surgery to uh, deal with the problem that's happening in that flail segment. I like this topic we're gonna to look at because it covers quite a lot. So let's look at upper airway obstruction. Now there's a blockage to the upper breathing passages. The patient is having difficulty breathing. They can't speak. They'll have that inability to breathe or speak. Most times, if they are choking, they are going to do the universal choking sign where you see them clutching their necks with both hands. That's what we refer to as the universal choking sign. If you look at their 
their skin, they start turning blue, which will refer to as cyanosis. So that's what you can also see with upper airway obstruction. They can even collapse and death can occur within four to five minutes. So again, if your patient is suffering from an upper airway obstruction, I'm not talking about when you are choking on the pursuit on Kwabi, no. I'm talking about when there's an actual obstruction to the airway. What are you going to see, especially if the patient is conscious? You want to assess that patient, assess if they're able to speak or cough. Are they able to speak or cough? If they are still choking. So again, that's the universal uh, choking sign I talked about. You're going to see them clutching their, their neck with both hands. And if they are still choking, uh, you want to give five back blows between the shoulder blade with the heels of your hands. And we want to give five abdominal thrusts, or what we refer to as a helmix maneuver. So again, with the helmix maneuver, you want to place the thumb side of your hand facing the navel, and then you use the other hand to place above a rib. You, you, you form a fist, you use the other hand to place above the fist. You want the thumb side facing the patient's navel, and then you are going to carry out abdominal thrust, a kind of a backwards and upwards movement where you are trying to uh, push out whatever is causing the obstruction. So again, we're going to try to use this to relieve choking in our patient. But if the choking is persisting, this patient can become unconscious. Again, if you are attempting to uh, dislodge this obstruction and the patient becomes unconscious, you want to lie him on the ground gently, and you want to immediately begin CPR. We'll talk about CPR in subsequent classes. You want to begin CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And please, you want to remove the object only if it's visible. Do not carry out a blind sweep. Don't just put your fingers in the mouth and try to see if you'll be lucky enough to dislodge whatever is causing the obstruction. You want to look into the mouth, and if you can see the object, then you want to try to take it, remove it. But if you don't see it, do not carry out a blind sweep. Okay, so we'll talk about CPR subsequently. But again, with upper air obstruction, we might need to suction our patient. I noticed some of us failed the suction uh, question. But again, when we are carrying out suctioning in our clients, you want to assist the client to an upright position, such as your semi fowlers and you want to hyperextend the head. So again, you want to assist the client to an upright position. We might need to pre-oxygenate or hyper-oxygenate the client. You can ask him to take four to five deep breaths, or maybe we can use a manual resuscitation bag, or if the client is on a mechanical ventilator, we can use a sign mechanism. So again, you must always remember to pre-oxygenate before you suction, and after you suction, you also want to oxygenate or hyper-oxygenate your client. And remember that the safe suction range for an adult is between 100 to 120 millimeters of mercury. And we're going to use intermittent suctioning for up to 10 to 15 seconds. Most textbooks we say do not suction for more than 10 seconds. And when you're suctioning, we don't apply suction while we are introducing the catheter. Okay, so you don't apply suction while we are introducing the catheter because that's going to traumatize the uh, mucosa and even remove the oxygen in the patient's respiratory tract. So you only suction while we are withdrawing the catheter. Again, we might also need to intubate our client with an upper airway obstruction. We might need to intubate and carry out a tracheostomy. Track, trachea, ostomy tells me a surgical incision, creating an opening. So with tracheostomy, we're going to carry out a surgical incision into the trachea, and a tube is going to, a tube is going to be inserted through that incision into the trachea. So again, this is what our tracheostomy is going to look like. So we're going to carry out a surgical incision, and then we're going to put a tracheostomy in the trachea. Again, you can see that inflation there. That's our cough. So most times you would notice that your tracheostomy tube would always have a cough. Okay. So we might also need to even suction our patient with a tracheostomy. We might even need to suction our patient 
even with a tracheostomy. So what are those things you would see that would uh, indicate to you that I need to suction this patient? If my patient has a tracheostomy and I'm hearing noisy respiration, I need to suction this patient. Noisy respiration, we need to suction the tracheostomy too. Again, if my patient is becoming restless, what did we say restlessness indicates on the NCLEX? It's telling you the patient is not oxygenating well. If it's becoming restless, then we need to suction uh, a tracheostomy too. Again, increased pulse, increased respiration, presence of mucus in the airway, or even hypoxia. If your patient is becoming hypoxic, then something might be obstructing your tracheostomy too. You need to suction the patient. How do you know your patient is getting hypoxic? Again, we said it will be restless. Look at the skin, it will be turning blue, what we refer to as cyanosis. It can become very anxious. It can become tachycardic. So again, that would tell me I need to suction my client's tracheostomy. Again, we'll cover tracheostomy as part of our client needs category with, uh, I think in the second week. So again, we'll still need to dwell on this. But what's our nursing consideration for tracheostomy in a client with upper airway obstruction? So again, the cough we talked about, that's your cough there. And we said it's used to prevent aspiration and also to facilitate mechanical ventilation. Again, we want to maintain this cough pressure at 14 to 20 millimeters of mercury. You also want to encourage fluids this would help to facilitate removal of secretions. And we'll need to carry out sterile suctioning if necessary and frequent oral hygiene. Still on upper airway obstruction, we might need to place the client on mechanical ventilation. So this will be a form of assistant ventilation where you are using a machine to either fully or partially provide artificial ventilation for your clients. So again, what's our nursing consideration for a client on a mechanical ventilator? We need to prepare this client psychologically for use of the ventilator. We need to monitor the client's response to the ventilator. We need to assess vital signs at least every four hours. We want to listen to breath sounds. Again, crackles. If I see crackles on the NCLEX, what does that tell me? There's fluid somewhere. If I can, I'm listening to breath sounds and I'm hearing kind of water that is, you know, when your water is boiling or your stew is boiling, that'll be crackles. When I hear crackles, that tells me there's fluid in the lungs, especially when I'm listening to breath sounds. That's not a good, that tells me uh, my client is retaining fluid in the, in the lungs. So again, you are looking out for crackles. You are looking out for wheezing. Are there equal breath sounds? Is he oxygenating well? Are there decreased or ab absent breath sounds in any regions that you are listening? So we want to listen to those breath sounds and get all of this uh, information. Again, we want to assess need for suctioning. We already talked about those indications when we might need to suction. We want to monitor his respiration, evaluate arterial blood gases. We need to carry out continuous pulse oximetry monitoring to get his SpO2 levels. We need to check for hypoxia. We already talked about this. How do you check for hypoxia? What would tell you your patient is hypoxic? All of a sudden, he becomes restless. I'm suspecting hypoxia. He's looking cyanotic. I'm suspecting hypoxia. He's becoming anxious, tachycardic. His respiratory rate is increasing. I'm suspecting hypoxia. We also need to assess neurologic status in our client. And we need to check the chest for bilateral expansion. So that tells me, yes both lungs are oxygenating well. We also need to provide good oral hygiene at least twice each shift. So remember that with our clients, with our clients on a ventilator, we need to provide oral hygiene at least twice each shift. We also need to assess need for tracheal or oral or nasal suctioning at least every two hours and perform as necessary. So again, you want to assess if we need to suction him at least every two hours. Again, look at those time frames I'm talking about. You need to take note of them. If he's on a ventilator, we're providing oral hygiene every twice every shift. 
Again, we want to assess if it needs to be suctioned. We need to carry out that assessment every two hours, and we need to perform that if necessary. Again, look at where the uh, endotracheal tube is. It can cause ulcers in this patient's mouth. So we want to move the endotracheal tube to the opposite side of the mouth every 24 hours to prevent those ulcers from forming. Again, another time frame, 24 hours. We want to move the tube to the opposite side of the mouth. We also want to monitor intake and output. Again, we need to create alternative methods of communication with this client. Either maybe bring a board with a pen or pencil and paper, you know, just an alternative method for communicating with this client. And the access or the call light must be very close to him so that he can call for help anytime he needs it. So you want to provide access to the call light for your patient. We also need to observe for any gastrointestinal distress. Is he having diarrhea or is he constipated? Is there any blood in this tool? You are looking out for all of that. And we need to document observations and procedures in our medical record. Again, still on upper airway obstruction, especially with our ventilator, you want to perform and document ventilator and equipment checks. Again, if there's anything you take out from this class today, I need you to take out this, that whatever it is on the NCLEX, you want to care for the patient first before your equipment. Care for the patient first before your equipment. In most times, when you have a question that has to deal with either uh, the patient monitor is, is showing uh, arrhythmia or whatever, you don't want to assess the monitor first. You want to assess your patient. If my ventilator alarms have gone off, I'm not rushing to the ventilator. I'm rushing to assess my patient first. Trust me, the exam is not that difficult. It's all about knowing when you need to assess and when you need to intervene. Again, in cases that require when you have to choose between your patient and your equipment, again, it's, it's just basic nursing knowledge. If I come to the bedside and the patient's monitor is showing me AC store, is showing me that flat line, I'm not going to just say, ah, this patient is dead and I cover him up and send him to the mortuary. No, I want to assess my patient first before I start dealing with the monitor that is showing me AC store. Again, if you, if you are not conversant with your ECG, Hopefully, we'll get to deal with uh, ECG readings and uh, chew them up on another session. But again, take this out of the class. Care for the client first and your equipment, or in this case, your ventilator second. Again, we also need to check ventilator settings as ordered by the healthcare providers because if the pressures are high, they could cause damage to the lung. We need to check that our alarms are set. Remember, the ventilator is equipped with safety alarms, and the alarm will sound if the ventilator readings exceed or drops below a certain limit that has been set on the ventilator. So always look at and attend to your patient first and address the alarm situation second. You want to remember that. So what kind of alarms could we have on our ventilator? There could be the low pressure alarms, and these low pressure alarms indicates that the pressure in the ventilator circuit has dropped. Usually there's a result of leak or maybe a disconnection. So you want to remember that if my low pressure alarm goes off on my patient, I'm already suspecting there's a leak somewhere or there's a disconnection. And when I'm searching for that disconnection or for that leak, I'm going to start from the patient and walk my way towards the ventilator. When I'm checking those for loose connections, so again, you want to start from the patient and walk your way towards the ventilator, checking for those loose connections. So this could also include maybe a leak at the site where the tracheostomy tube enters the neck. So again, you are looking out for leaks. So when I see a low pressure alarm on my monitor, um, I'm already suspecting a leak or a disconnection somewhere along the line. Again, look at your patient. If you come in and the patient is struggling for air, please immediately disconnect the connection from the patient and manually ventilate this patient with your resuscitation bag or your BVM or your ambu bag, whichever you call it. So if they are struggling for air, disconnect the circuit from the patient and manually ventilate with an ambu bag, and then you can call for help. We could also have a high pressure alarm. So again, with a high pressure alarm, 
It tells us that the pressure in the circuit has increased. Again, this, this, these settings help to protect the lungs from high pressure that our ventilator can deliver. And what could cause a high pressure alarm? It could be as a result of secretions or water. If there's water in the tubing, it can cause a high pressure alarm. If there's kinks in the tubing, it can also cause a high pressure alarm. So again, you can see this has to do with more of fluids. So maybe a secretion or water in the tube or even a kink. This could cause a high pressure alarm. And again, we want to suction the patient and look for where this uh, fluid or secretions or water is coming from that is causing this obstruction and causing the high pressure alarm to sound. And if does not, if, if any of this, if suctioning the patient doesn't fix the problem, you want to disconnect the patient from the circuit and again, manually ventilate with an ambu bag and then we can call for help. Still on upper air obstruction, you want to check the temperature and level of water in the humidification system of your ventilator. We want to check that the PEEP, that positive end expiratory pressure, that PEEP that's maintained at the end of expiration. Remember that why are we maintaining that positive end expiratory pressure? To prevent atelectasis, to prevent collapse of the alveoli. That's why we need to place them on PEEPs. Okay, so that's going to help to improve oxygenation. So you want to check that the PEEP is maintained at the pressure that is set. We also want to drain condensate from the tubing. So when you are draining this condensation or the condensate, you want to drain from the tubing away from the patient, away from the client. So we are draining away from the client. And we also want to verify that the tracheostomy or the endotracheal cuff is inflated because that's going to help to ensure tie down volume. So again, with PEEP, we talked about PEEP and we said it helps to prevent the alveoli from collapsing, but we must remember that PEEP can lead to increased intrathoracic pressure. Remember we talked about increased intrathoracic pressure yesterday when we talked about uh, the Vasava maneuver and that could decrease the client's cardiac output. So you want to look out for that. Again, how would you know your client's is having an adverse effect or a complication as a result of the PEEP that is placed on. You could see that the systolic blood pressure begins to fall. The pulse, there's this compensatory increase in the pulse. So that would tell you my client is having or suffering from a complication from PEEP. So again, you must know that uh, effect that we can get from PEEP, which is that it increases intrathoracic pressure and can ultimately lead to a decrease cardiac output. Let's talk about pneumothorax. Pneumo, pneumo, breathing, respiration, or lungs, or pneumonia, or air. So again, pneumo, so it could be air, it could be breathing. It could, so now we have air in the thorax. So again, pneumothorax, look at this image. You can see one of the lungs has totally collapsed. That's what we refer to as pneumothorax. So there's a collapse of the lung due to air in the pleural space. So you have air in the pleural space. What if we had air or fluid within the pericardial sac? That would be a cardiac tamponade. So you want to know and differentiate either of these. So again, the pneumothorax would be uh, when the lungs collapse due to air in the pleural space. Again, it could be caused by that surgery or disease or trauma. And it could be a spontaneous pneumothorax. With spontaneous, we don't even know what the cause is. All of a sudden it develops. Or it could be a tension pneumothorax. Again, this is a very, very, very nice topic you could always see on the NCLEX. So with tension pneumothorax, air is trapped in the pleural space. But this time it's trapped under positive pressure. So there's like some kind of pressure uh, in this air that's trapped in the pleural space. And what is it going to cause? It's going to cause the mediastinal structures to shift. It's going to cause the heart, it's going to cause the great vessels to shift. And when it shifts and it dislodges these uh, mediastinal structures, what is going to compromise cardiopulmonary function. So you start seeing your clients exhibiting signs of shock, it, it becomes hypotensive. So again, with tension pneumothorax, again, very key. What do we see? We see that there's going to be this mediastinal shift. So you're going to see this mediastinal shift in the great vessel. So you can see this part of the lung is the one that has collapsed. And then you are having this other good side, drawing it to 
the unaffected side. So you're going to see that with the sternal shift. So you see the collapsed lungs and then the great vessels, the heart, and it's all dragged to the right side. That's a tension in motonax. Another thing you will see would be tracheal deviation. So you can see how the, throat, the, the trachea is no longer aligned at the center. It's kind of deviated to the right. Again, the NCLEX is not going to tell you your client came in with tension pneumothorax. They're going to tell you you are looking at the throat and you are noticing tracheal deviation. And you're noticing tracheal deviation. So again, that should tell you, that should tell you your client has tension pneumothorax. Okay. So again, we could also have a hemothorax, hemo. Hemo tells me blood. So this time around, uh, we are kind of having blood in the plural space. Now let's talk about what could cause a pneumothorax. One common cause would be a pulmonary bleb. What's a pulmonary bleb? It's actually a blister. So you can see those blisters there. So you have blisters that are filled with serous fluids and these blisters could rupture. And that could lead to, especially you have them with clients in COPD. So if this uh, blisters rupture, that could cause to, uh, lead to a pneumothorax in our client. So that's one common cause. Um, another cause could be, okay, so let me highlight this. Okay, we already talked about the ruptured blebs. A thorax synthesis could also cause uh, a pneumothorax. Again, thorax tells me the thorax synthesis is a uh, suffix for puncture and aspiration. So you are aspirating. So we are puncturing and we are aspirating. So again, that's a procedure to remove fluid from the pleural cavity. So again, in trying to remove fluid from the pleural cavity, we can end up puncturing the lobes at the lungs and causing it to collapse. So your thorax synthesis can also cause a tension pneumothorax. Again, that's a complication of a thorax synthesis as a procedure. So again, the anklets can tell you the patient came in with um, fluid um, in the lungs and then a thoracentesis was carried out and all of a sudden he starts complaining of uh, uh, difficulty breathing and signs of shock and all of that. So you're already thinking, could it be that my patient is suffering a complication of the thoracentesis, which would be a pneumothorax? Again, that's how you want to think on the anklets. You must be a critical thinker. A trauma could cause a pneumothorax. A secondary infection could also cause a pneumothorax. So what symptoms would you see in our clients with pneumothorax? Normally they will present, it's affecting the lungs. So that usually they're going to present with respiratory distress, including dyspnea or difficulty breathing. Their breathing will be fast. Their heart rate will be fast. So you're going to see tachycardia. Um, you will see dyspnea, which is that shortness of breath. We could also see pleuritic pain or pleural pain, plural. So again, we talked about fluid being in the plural space. So they could have pain in the plural space. So that would be what we refer to as pleuritic pain. And they will tell you that this pain is sudden and, and very sharp and it's very intense. It's kind of like somebody stabbing their chest with a knife or a burning pain in the chest, especially when they are inhaling and exhaling. That's what we refer to as pleuritic pain. So it's a sudden and very intense, sharp pain. It could be either a burning pain, it could be a stabbing pain, and they notice it, they feel it when their chest is moving, when they are inhaling and exhaling. And it becomes very worse, maybe if they sneeze or if they laugh or when they are coughing or when they are deep breathing, the pain is exacerbated. So that would tell you this patient is having a pleuritic pain. Again, that's one symptom you will see with a, uh, pneumothorax. Again, we could have asymmetrical chest wall expansion. A, prefix for absence. So the symmetry, we're not going to see that regular symmetrical chest wall expansion. So you could have an absence uh, chest wall expansion, especially on the affected side. So the chest wall movement may be absent or it could be restricted. They may also have decreased breath sounds or absent breath sounds, especially on the side of the chest with the pneumothorax. If you look at them, they will be cyanotic. They might be coughing, they could have a fever and all of that. Let's look at traumatic pneumothorax. 
trauma, traumatic pneumothorax. They are actually divided into open and closed pipes. And with the open pneumothorax, there's an open communication between the environment and the pleural cavity through the chest wall. So it's going to be that open communication from the outside and the pleural cavity through the chest wall. So with open pneumothorax, most times it's called a sucking. You have this sucking chest wound. So air is being sucked. So you're going to notice that air is being sucked into the thoracic cavity through the chest wall. Normally, air should come in from the airways into the lungs, but now from an opening on the chest, there's that communication and air is being sucked in. And with these patients with uh, this kind of sucking chest wounds, because this sucking chest wound now is going to cause the lungs to collapse. So you can see that the lungs has collapsed as the air is being sucked in to fill the pleural space. And you're going to see that they would have this bubbling blood with uh, inspiration and expiration. So if you look at where they have that open communication, you will notice that the blood will be bubbling there when they inspire and they expire. So that tells you there's an open connection. What symptoms are we going to see in our clients with an open pneumothorax? Obviously, there's going to be pain. If you try to percuss, if we carry out percussion, again, what are we going to hear? We're going to hear hyper resonance. You know, normally the lungs are filled with air when we breathe in. And if you carry out percussion, you should normally hear a low pitched hollow sound because the lungs are filled with air. But in clients with uh, open pneumothorax, you're going to hear high power resonance. So the, the, it's going to be a sound above normal that is dull. And this tells you there's trauma or there's lung disease or a pneumothorax. So again, we're going to see high power resonance we're going to see decreased respiratory excursion. So clients with chest trauma are always going to have what we call decreased respiratory excursion. So the movement of the thoracic diaphragm during breathing will be decreased. So if you look at the thoracic diaphragm, the movement is usually going to be decreased. That's what we refer to as decreased respiratory excursion. If you put your two thumbs behind the patient, touching each other at the midline, you will notice that one thumb will move away and the other thumb will be restricted. So there will be decreased respiratory excursion in this client. There will also be diminished or absent breath sounds on the affected side. We could see weak and rapid pulse and that sucking sound that we're going to hear on inspiration and expiration. The client will be anxious and they will be sweating excessively or what we refer to as diaphoresis. So what procedures are we going to carry out for clients with chest trauma? We can carry out a thoracentesis, which we said is a procedure in which a needle is inserted into the pleural space between the lungs and the chest. So that would be a thoracentesis. But again, we said we'll look at this as a topic on its own when we look at therapeutic procedures for the NCLEX. We can also insert a chest tube which is a hollow flexible tube that's placed into the chest to act as a drain. So again, we would also look at this as a topic of its own when we look at it under underwater seal drains and we'll break it down in another class. Let's quickly look at acute laryngotracheal bronchitis or what we refer to as croup. Again, acute tells me sudden. Laryngo tells me larynx, trachea, tracheo tells me trachea, bronch, bronch, so I know the bronchus are involved, and itis tells me inflammation. So whatever is happening in these big words, I know that all of these uh, airway tracts are inflamed. So I know there's inflammation there, and I know when there's inflammation, there's usually swelling. So with croup or laryngotracheal bronchitis, it's actually a type of respiratory infection that affects the larynx and the trachea and is caused by a virus. So again, if we look at this image, you would notice how the airway is swollen. Okay, so you will notice how the airway is swollen and that narrows the airway in this client. Again, it's a disease that causes swelling in the airway and causes breathing problems. 
It's a medical emergency due to that narrowed airway. Children, and they are at very high risk for suffocation, and they can become very anxious when they have that fear, that suffocation feeling when their airway is being narrowed by that swelling. So when we assess our clients, what are we going to see? One common sign you need to note is this backing sound, almost like um, it's almost like a sea lion. You can Google it after the class and you want to hear how the sea lion backs. So that's what you're going to hear. The client is going to have this back-like cough. That tells me my client is probably having an acute LTB or croup. Again, remember, usually you see croup in clients between three months to three years. So again, if the NCLEX tells you a two-year-old child presented um, well, maybe initially he had an upper respiratory tract infection and now he's presenting with a back-like cough. You want to start suspecting croup in your patient. Again, we said you're going to, it happens, it occurs in ages between three months to three years. And usually an upper respiratory infection precedes the client presenting with croup. And we're going to see this backing cough or this uh, back-like cough. One other thing you would see would be inspiratory stridor. Again, for the NCLEX, you must take note of inspiratory stridor. When I see inspiratory stridor, I'm thinking about upper airway of structure. Upper airway of structure. Anytime I see inspiratory stridor, I'm thinking about upper airway of structure. So we're going to see retractions in this client, sternal retractions. So when I see inspiratory stridor, I see those uh, sternal retractions or noisy breathing, that tells me my patient is having an airway obstruction. And that's a sign of compromised airway. That tells me my client is in respiratory distress. So again, the entrance may tell you the patient presented with nasal flaring, uh, inspiratory stridor, sternal, reaction, uh, sternal retractions. I'm already thinking of croup in my patients. But again, this noisy breathing we are talking about, is becoming noisy because air is still being able to pass. Again, on the NCLEX, any decrease in noisy respiration tells me is it compensation. My patient is getting worse. There's that loss of physiological compensation. That patient has lost the ability to maintain adequate respiration. You must take note of that on the NCLEX. Yes, we said noisy respiration is not a good thing, but if there's a sudden decrease in noisy respiration, then that calls for further assessment in your patient. That means we need to do something for our patients. Again, it occurs at night, and you're going to have this patient having that air hunger that may progress to hypoxic state. Remember, if it becomes hypoxic, he's going to be restless. He's going to start turning blue uh, due to lack of oxygen in the blood. We're also going to see use of accessory muscles for breathing in this patient. Now let's look at our care for this client at home. We might need to place him in a steamy shower because that's gonna to help to reduce that swelling in the airway. We might take him outside. That helps, the, the, that cold air also helps to relieve stridor. So if it's cold outside, you can take the child outside because that sudden exposure to cold air is gonna to help to relieve stridor. Uh, the client can sleep in a cool, humidified air tent or a cooling tent. We might even need to sit with the client in a bathroom filled with steam. So that's also going to help uh, to alleviate the symptoms the patient is having. Again, if it's not an acute presentation, but hospitalization will be required if there's increasing respiratory distress. If the hypoxia continues to uh, be persistent or you notice that there's Dep there's a depression or his sensorium is depressed or the fever keeps escalating, then we might need to uh, hospitalize the child. And what we need to do when we hospitalize this child, very important with the NCLEX, airway patency. If the airway is not patent, we can't look at breathing, we can't look at circulation, we can't look at any other body system. Again, we said the airway is inflamed, and the airway is closing up, the airway is narrowing. You must keep a tracheostomy at the patient's bedside in case we need to intervene. Again, for croup, 
we must always keep a tracheostomy set at the bedside. Please take note of that. We need to place our client on oxygen. Again, we can use a humidifier. We may even need to place the client in an oxygen hood. So this would be your oxygen hood. It, it actually contains warmed and humidified oxygen, and it's actually used for babies who can breathe on their own, but still need extra oxygen. We will need to monitor the client's heart rate and respiration while we're monitoring all of this. We're looking out for that sign. There's no signs of hypoxia in our client. We need to place them on IV fluids. We need to give them medications like our nebulized epinephrine. It's also called Resmic. That's what is, we use that to treat croup in our patients. Uh, we can give him bronchodilators to help to open up the airways because of the fever. We can give them antipyretics. We can give them steroids. And again, we'll need to prop the infant with pillows or in an infant seat. Let's look at epiglottitis. Again, the epiglottis, what is that? Remember that leaf-shaped flap of cartilage that you feel or you see behind the tongue? That's your epiglottis. And the main function of the epiglottis is to seal up the windpipe when we are eating so that food doesn't go into the trachea. Now, this leaf-shaped flap can become inflamed. Again, when it becomes inflamed, it becomes a potentially life-threatening condition. Again, for the NCLEX, you must remember that epiglottitis is caused by the hemophilus influenza type B. Again, epiglottitis is caused by the hemophilus influenza type B. What are we going to see in our client when we assess our client? They would have that sore throat. Their throat is always going to be sore. They would have difficulty swallowing or dysphagia. Again, they will be drooling because the epiglottis is inflamed. They will be drooling. So you will see excessive salivation in their mouth. So they're going to be drooling. They will have shortness of breath or deep snare. Again, we said they will have sore throat. We already talked about that. They will have inspiratory stridor. So again, inspiratory stridor will be that whistling sound when they are taking a breath. You would also notice that the client would always take a tripod position. What's a tripod position? So that's what it looks like there. So that's an, a child in a tripod position. So you will notice that they sit or they stand leaning forward, supporting the upper body with their hands, either on their knee or on another surface. So you can see him kind of leaning forward and supporting, putting his hands to support himself leaning forward. So that's what we refer to as the tripod position. Again, you want to take note of that because the anklets might not tell you this client has epiglottitis, but it could tell you he's complaining of a sore throat and you notice him sitting and leaning forward. Again, the anklets is more about symptom identification and you want to look out for all of that. Again, what else are we going to see in this client? So we can use this image. Again, we said the airway is closing up because the epiglottis is getting inflamed. Their pulse will be increased because of the hypoxia. They will be restless. You would see those sternal retractions. They will be anxious because their throat is kind of closing up. There's that inflammation going on there. We'll see inspiratory stridor. You can see once there's a problem in the upper airway, you would always see inspiratory stridor. So when I see inspiratory stridor on the NCLEX, I'm thinking about upper airway obstruction. And look at all of the saliva coming from his mouth. And we say this client is always going to be drooling. Again, what's our plan for this client? So what's our, pl our plan for this client? We'll need to place him on antibiotics. Remember we said uh, it's caused by hemophilus influenza type B. So we'll need to place him on antibiotics. Uh, what else again? We need to place a tracheostomy tube by the patient's bedside. And one other thing you need to take note of is that if the epiglottis is, in, is swollen, if it's inflamed, you don't want to stimulate the gag reflex. You don't want to try to see whether it's inflamed or not, because when you do that, it can actually stimulate the gag reflex and cause complete obstruction of the glottis. 
resulting to respiratory failure. So again, it should never be checked for a person with suspected epiglottitis. So again, if you look at the image, um, you will see, we say, do not examine the truth. So that's a tongue blade there with an X written on it. So please remember for the NCLEX, do not examine the truth. Do not examine the truth of a patient with glottitis because you can cause further inflammation and further obstruction of the airway causing respiratory failure. Again, the NCLEX is not gonna ask you this straight on, but it will tell you a new graduate nurse is about to or uh, is about to assess a patient who just came in with severe drooling and restlessness and uh, sternal retractions. You want to start suspecting epiglottitis in your patient. And like we said, for the previous patient, we always want to have our tracheostomy to our tracheostomy tray available by the bedside because of any. Uh, failure, respiratory failure that may arise, we might need to carry out a tracheostomy on the patient. Again, a breathing tube and ventilator may also be required. Let's quickly look at bronchial asthma. Again, it is a condition in which a person's airway becomes inflamed, it becomes narrow and swell, produces extra mucus, which makes it difficult to breathe. What do we see in our patients with bronchial asthma. Again, let's even start with what might trigger a bronchial asthma. So again, our client may be hypersensitive or maybe as a result of upper respiratory infection or exercise or even an air pollutant or even with air pollutants or respiratory infections, any of these could trigger um, uh, asthma in our patients. How about um, symptoms we'll see in this patient? Okay, so we're going to see that frequent cough, especially at night, with increased mucus production. So you're going to see frequent cough, especially at night, with increased mucus production. It will have difficulty breathing or shortness of breath, wheezing, and prolonged expiration. That's another common symptom you will see in clients with asthma. They will have wheezing and prolonged expiration. Uh, there will be increased CO2 retention. In these patients, you would notice chest tightness and also those sternal retraction because they are trying to breathe. Okay, so let's look at our plan for these clients. So again, asthma can usually be managed with rescue inhalers like our albuterol. We can use albuterol or our ventolin to treat symptoms. Albuterol is a beta-2 adrenergic drug. So again, remember, albuterol is a rescue inhaler. It contains a fast-acting medication that helps with sudden trouble breathing. So that's what you want to use if a patient is having an acute asthma attack. Again, we can also manage asthma with our controller inhalers. These ones can help to prevent symptoms. For example, would be your Montelukast. It's used to prevent and treat asthma. It's used for prophylactic and maintenance therapy of asthma. Again, it's not useful for acute asthma attack. This is a controller inhaler. Again, with clients who use your Montelukast, you want to advise them to gargle and rinse their mouth with water after each dose. It's going to help to prevent any throat irritation. It's going to help to prevent any infection in the throat. So remember, you want to advise the client to gargle and rinse their mouth with water after each dose to prevent throat irritation and infection in the mouth. We can also use spacers with these inhalers. So that's your spacer there. So again, you can see the inhaler is connected to the spacer. And these spacers would help to hold, when you press down on the medication, it's going to help to hold the medication in the chamber long enough for the client to inhale the medication directly to the airways. Again, one thing you need to remember for the NCLEX is these clients with hypersensitivity uh, who have asthma, we don't want to give them ibuprofen. We don't want to give them aspirin. We don't want to give them beta blockers. Here, you want to take note of those three. Clients with asthma 
We want to avoid giving them ibuprofen. We want to avoid giving them aspirin. We want to avoid giving them beta blockers. Why? It can cause their throats to close up. It can cause bronchospasm. Ibuprofen is an NSA. Aspirin, we don't want to give them aspirin. We don't want to give them beta blockers because beta blockers are going to block those airway beta receptors and it's going to cause bronchospasm in this client. So we don't give, again, I repeat, ibuprofen, aspirin, or beta blockers in aspirin-sensitive asthmatics because it could lead to bronchospasm in this client. You need to take note of that on the NCLEX. So again, we already talked about use of spacers. We can give them anticholinergics like our hypotropium, theotropium, and even theophylline. So again, we can give them a protium, theotropium, and theophylline. Remember, these anticholinergics, these are drugs that block the actions of acetylcholine. Remember, acetylcholine increases body secretions. So again, we said these clients with asthma have increased mucus production. So these anticholinergics would help to decrease those bodily secretions. So, your filing is actually a bronchodilator. It would also help to open up the airway. But let's talk about theotropium. Again, look at this, what theotropium looks like. One key thing that will catch your attention will be these tablets here. So normally, you are supposed to put this tablet in this handy handler for the patient to use. Theotropium is usually taken once a day and at the same time every day. And you can see it comes in a capsule form. So you want to advise the client not to swallow this capsule. Again, you need to take note of that on the NCLEX. With theotropium, you want to advise the client because they will see it as a regular capsule and they might think they, can, uh, they need to swallow it. So you want to advise them, if your client is taking theotropium, you want to advise the client not to swallow this capsule. Okay, so let's look at a protropium. Again, it's actually sold under the brand name Atrovent. It's actually an anticholinergic medication. It helps to open up the airways. It's used to treat symptoms of asthma. And again, it can be used by either inhaler or a nebulizer. And just a summary of how we can manage asthma in our clients. Again, we said we can give those beta-2 agonists like our albuterol. We can place them on steroids. We can place them on theophylline. Remember we said uh, theophylline is a, is a bronchodilator that would help to open up the airway. We we'll need to keep them hydrated because of that excess uh, mucus production. We we'll need to place them on oxygen and we we'll also need to place them on anticholinergics like our ipratropium and our theo. Our client could, could also go into status asthmaticus. Again, with status asthmaticus, here the client will have an asthma attack that doesn't improve with treatments. Maybe you are giving them the bronchodilators and it's still not improving. And these attacks can last for several minutes or even hours. Again, we might need to give them corticosteroids. We'll need to give them theophylline to help to open up the airway. Remember, we said bronco etiophylline is a bronchodilator and it can be used to treat clients with asthma. And I think we're looking at the last topic for the day, hopefully, which would be chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It's actually a group of lung disease that block airflow and make it difficult to breathe. The main cause of COPD is smoking. Smoking is a main cause of COPD. Again, our emphysema and chronic bronchitis is what make up our COPD. Emphysema tells me air, air in the lung sacs. So the air sacs in the lungs are damaged, and bronchitis tells me the bronchial is inflamed. So there's inflammation of the bronchial tube. Again, these are the most common conditions that make up COPD. Now, what are we going to see in our clients with COPD? What are the symptoms we will see in this client? Again, like we said, the NCLEX is all about being able to identify symptoms. Um, one of them would be the client to be easily fatigued. 
they would have frequent respiratory infections. When they try to breathe, you will see that they use accessory muscles to breathe. They would be autopnic. What's autopnia again? That difficulty in breathing when they lie down. So when they lie down, they will have difficulty breathing. But when they stand up or change to an upright position, they start breathing better. So we see this in clients with COPD. We could also see this in clients with uh, congestive heart failure. Okay, so what else are we going to see in our patients? We can also see core pulmonaire. We can also see core pulmonaire in this patient. That will be failure of the right side of the heart. Usually, there's a late sign in COPD. So we're going to see core pulmonaire in this patient. We would also see wheezing, post lip breathing. They will have this chronic cough. So they will present with shortness of breath, dyspnea. You will see this barrel chest in the client. So they have this lab, large uh, rib cage. So, and then there will be prolonged expiratory time. And again, if you look at their fingers, you're going to see digital clubbing. Again, what's digital clubbing? So that's digital clubbing there. And that's what it looks like. So you're going to see digital clubbing in this client. So again, those are symptoms you're going to see with COPD. And you can see how most of the symptoms are almost looking like the client is having a heart failure because we can see that autopnea. We said when he lies down, he can't breathe. When he sits up, he breathes better. There's core pulmonaire, which is failure of the right side of the heart. That's also uh, one other sign you see in clients with COPD. In terms of our plan, remember when we give them medication, we want to give bronchodilators first because that's going to help to open up the airway before we now start giving other medications. So remember, you want to give bronchodilators first to help to open up the airway, after which we can give other medication. Again, we can give our clients Advair. It's actually used for maintenance treatment of COPD. It's one of the most commonly used inhalers for COPD treatment. Uh, Advair contains our fluticasone, which is a corticosteroid. It also contains salmetrol, which is a bronchodilator. So this is what we're going to use for our clients with COPD. Uh, we might also need to administer low flow oxygen. Again, keyword there, COPD, low flow oxygen. Again, if you are sleeping, I need you to wake up and take this to dreamland. Remember that clients with COPD, we want to give them low flow oxygen because it's going to prevent CO2 narcosis. Remember, in clients with COPD, that low arterial oxygen level, that's what is driving this patient to breathe. That's the client's primary drive for breathing. So if high levels of oxygen are administered, the client may lose that respiratory drive and the client is going to go into respiratory failure. So please. Take note of that. We don't want, if we put this client on oxygen, we don't want to give him more than two to three liters per minute because the client's primary drive for breathing is that low arterial oxygen level. We want to take note of that for the NCLEX. Again, when we give these clients medication, we want to teach them to rinse their mouth thoroughly with water after steroid treatment to reduce risk of infection from oral candidiasis. Again, take note of that for the NCLEX. When we treat our clients with steroid, we need them to rinse their mouth thoroughly with water to minimize the risk of infection from oral candidiasis. And finally, we need to encourage fluids in our clients. So we need to encourage them to have at least six to eight glasses of water or 3,000 meals in 24 hours. We need to provide small frequent feedings uh, remember, these clients with COPD, especially when it becomes worse, they have this ineffective coughing and excessive sputum in their airway. So we want to assess them for their knowledge of proper coughing technique. We want to assess them for factors such as dehydration. That's how we want to manage our client COPD. At this point, I'd like to say thank you for attending. If you have any questions, you might uh, unmute yourself and we can take them now. Thank you very much.